This is our Afroeconomics tribute to King Day 2020. Afroeconomics and the firm of J.B. Bryant Financial Group is celebrating 25 years of serving Black investors. During my career, I have met people who were not able to establish investment accounts at firms. So I think at, at investment, I think sometimes we take for granted the opportunities that we have and, and we forget about the opportunities that were taken away from us. So I challenge us to think as we go through our lives, not just today, but as we go through our lives, that we, that we remain awake. And in thinking about today's discussion and how important it was for me to, to have this discussion and to have this in our archives of Afroeconomics, I started like just listening to uh, the speeches again. Cause you know, ever since, you know, we're in school, we always hear the King speeches and everything. But um, now, I don't know this all the, every time I listen to them, I get a different perspective and there's so many of them. And the same with um, Malcolm X's interviews and his speeches um, there. I think that it's very important that we as black professionals that are contributing to society today, remember and, and listen to the words of those who came before us. It reminds and it humbles us of how far we have to go. Now, that one of the final discussions or sermons that Martin Luther King Jr. made was called Remaining Awake. Uh, and I don't know if that was the, the title of it, but that's what I pulled from it. It was about remaining awake through a great revolution. And in the final sermon in March, or one of the final sermons, but this one was March 31st, 1968. And he did it in Washington, D.C., and it looks like in the video that basically the almost all of the audience was white. It was definitely a white church because all of the people behind him were white people. And during the sermon he made, Dr. King made reference to the story about Rip Van Winkle, a character in a book. Now, Rip Van Winkle slept in the book for 20 years. And during the time that he was sleeping, like when he was going up to go to sleep up the mountain for whoever was going to go to sleep, he passed a sign and it said who the ruler was of the country at that time. And when he slept 20 years, he came back and it was a totally different ruler of the world or of his country after that when he woke up. So he slept through the revolution. A revolution had happened <laughs> and Rip Van Winkle slept through it that a revolution had happened that the world as he knew it had changed and he slept through it all. So today, as we celebrate King Day, I am forced to ask myself, am I awake? And I ask you, are you awake? And if you are asleep, how many years have you been asleep? And how much has happened? And what is the day that to write now we have a revolution that's going on. You know, as Gil Scott Heron said, the revolution will not be televised. But today's revolution, in many ways, is being televised. And we're sleeping through it. And it's on the internet. And we're sleeping through it. And it's in the classroom. And we're sleeping through it. And it's at the banks. And we're sleeping through it. There was a story done the other day about uh, these uh, white financial advisors, they have them on recording saying all of these terrible things about the black people who were bringing their assets to the firm. And they were saying that, you know what they're gonna do it. It was like someone had, in, had um, won a lawsuit or inherited some money, I don't know exactly the situation, but these brothers were suing the firm and they had recordings of what had been said about these black people that were bringing their assets to that company. <laughs> but still today, I'm sure you can find some of us that are sleeping through it and have money at companies 
that are not who do not care and could care less and do not do not want they didn't even want the money there because they said that they were convinced that we were going to waste it. So after this, Rip Van Winkle and, and, um, and he's, as he spoke to this audience, this majority white audience about sleeping through a revolution, he, that is also applicable to us. I know that he was saying it to them because he was saying that all of this is going on and we need you to help us and join us in this. But all of this is going on and I need you to help yourself through this. So a few days later, April 3rd, 1968, Martin Luther King gave what is known as his last speech before his assassination in Tennessee. And Dr. S Dr. King spoke about our collective economic power. He said, now the other thing we'll have to do is this. Always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. Now, we are poor people. Individually, we are poor. When you compare us with white society in America, we are poor. These are the words of King. Never stop and forget that collectively, that means all of us together, collectively, we are richer than all the nations in the world, with the exception of nine. Did you ever think about that? After you leave the United States, so 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 um, Soviet Russia, Great Britain, West Germany, France, and I can name the others, the, the American Negro collectively is richer than most nations of the world. We have an annual income. Now this, this is King's quote, I'm quoting him. He said, we have an annual income we have an annual income of more than $30 billion a year. This is 1968, which is more than all of the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. Did you know that? That's the power. That's power right there. If you know how to pull it, unquote. Mm. So there in 1968, he spoke of the importance of our collective economic power. It is the purpose of Afroeconomics. Afroeconomics is a proactive effort to build a group that represents the financial power of our Black world. World. It says, of America and abroad. You'll note that. Afroeconomics. So here are 10 MLK empowerment steps to continue to move us forward through 2020 and beyond. Now I start with the mind is the standard of the man because it is our mindset that is going to allow us to appreciate and get involved and grow Afroeconomics and to have your to have, you are Afroeconomics. We are Afroeconomics. The, when they have, we need to protect ourselves from what can happen again economically. Who was hurt the most during the time of economic exploitation of all of these loans that destroyed black wealth within the last 10 years and we're still recovering from the foreclosures of the predatory lending that was done to our community. There has been research done that proves that, that, that these loans have contributed greatly to the poverty in our community. But still, a big, I mean, the biggest check, the biggest check, one of the biggest checks, I'm just gonna say one of, because they might find a bigger check. One of the biggest checks ever written to corporate America ever was written without any consideration of the financial victims. And that's why we need to have a, 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 a economic voice. Afroeconomics is a collective economic voice that we are not to be exploited. The mind is the standard of the man. 
In, in The Strength to Love in 1963, M.O.K. said the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at the times of challenge and controversy. Another quote, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Let longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. The mind is the standard of the man. Is your mind committed to doing God's will over your life, living your purpose? Another quote, we have fought hard and long for integration. And as I believe we should have, and I know that we will win, but I've come to believe we're integrating into a burning house. I'm afraid that America may be losing what moral vision she may have had. And I'm afraid that even as we integrate, we are walking into a place that does not understand that this nation needs to be deeply concerned with the plight of the poor and the disenfranchised until we commit ourselves to ensuring that the underclass is given justice and opportunity, we will continue to perpetuate the anger and violence that tears at the soul of this nation. I could be saying that today. And a last quote on this, the strength of our mind. And our mind is, is where we set our standards. But for when he says, and I've been to the mountaintop speech in April of 1968, for when people get caught up with that which is right, they are willing to sacrifice for it. There is no stopping point short of victory. That has to be our mindset. We have to get caught up in what is right, not in what looks good but what is right and be willing to sacrifice for it. I, I, was, I was speaking to a group of women who are working on taking a trip to visit, you know, the, the, to make the ultimate religious trip of their religion, to go to the roots of their religion. And I was explaining to them in order to make that happen, they have to be willing to sacrifice for it and not be and not even consider stopping short of victory. Well, if you see whatever you see as the promised land for you in developing as a person, you have to be able to get caught up in it and remember that this is for what is right. And many times I talk to entrepreneurs who are doing the right thing and start getting irritated by what looks good in this world. But they're doing the right thing. They're helping families. They're building wealth for generations. They're making a difference in the world, but they're getting, you, you cannot stop short of victory. My second point, and I have 10 points on how we're going to use the thoughts of the standard, the mindset, the basic standards of that, that King set for himself to make them as part of our life, moving, our life moving forward, and our life moving forward as a group in Afroeconomics. Protect your family. Protect your family by any means. That is a basic requirement. The first principle of Afroeconomics is legacy, understanding your why, creating generational wealth, making a commitment to it. He's, King says in August 1963, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. They are still, his children are still today being judged by the color of their skin. There's some people who didn't back then, and there's still some people who don't right now. And the most important part of it is, is that we accept that that we accept the reality of we are still being judged unfairly by some people. And you will free yourself and move forward in love 
by being by accepting the fact that there are some people who are sick and there are some people who are healthy but i'm not going to allow anyone's sickness to destroy my life but i'm going to keep you going to keep that dream alive and not stop short of victory let us develop another quote from king let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness that you are willing to sacrifice it all for your family protect your family protect your family when i send out things to my members of afro economics i say hello family because you are my family i have a dangerous unselfishness about looking out for your interest yes a third point understand understand the political system understand that this it is a political system i, I feel that it is dangerous for us to part to partner as a community with a political system or political group I believe that as a people, we are bigger than that. We are bigger than that. I believe that individually, we don't really have to agree politically on which political party, but we need to agree on what is in the best interest of our family and our community. We can agree on that because we are bigger than a political system that is going to make sure that it benefits and it can benefit at the demise of us. So for when people get caught up with that which is right and they are willing to sacrifice for it, there's no stopping short of victory. Get caught up again on what is right. And then check this out in, in Birmingham jail. He was in jail when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directs, affects all indirectly. If you're in jail, I'm in jail. When you do bad, you affect me, I do bad. And I write about that in the book. We have to realize that what you do <laughs> affects me and what I don't do affects you and what I do affects you right injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere so if you get on the side of a political party and you're with that political party and there's injustice that's done in that political party what are you going to do rise above that give our vote value by being united as a family of people who are against injustice. We are about justice. Another quote from King, there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor politic nor popular, but he must take it because his conscience tells him it is right. My conscience tells me that Afroeconomics is right. That I get quotes all the time and people will say, and I, I can't say all the time, but sometimes people will say mean things about Afroeconomics. And when I post something, I posted a, a post one time about the strength of the black father and how engaged black men are in parenting and that research was done and it was backed by research. And I had very mean comments about it. They did not, they were people that did not want that to be said, anything positive to be said about the black man and his commitment to being a great father. And I also noted that Obama had been quoted for saying some negative things about the black father that was not true. He said that the black father was disengaged, but the research showed and is proven that they were actually engaged and engaged in many other fathers on many levels. But I have to be used that, okay, this isn't popular. Nobody wants to hear me say that. They'd rather hear a black woman say something negative about the black man 
but you can't use me for that. And it's not popular. And maybe I won't get as many likes, but that doesn't matter to me. It's about doing what I know, my conscious knows is right and speaking the truth. I don't care who didn't read all of the information, you're wrong. A fourth point, understanding the value of education and training. It says education must enable a man to become, and this is a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Education must enable a man to become more efficient, to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of his life. So when I do the team of the Afroeconomics Team Summit that's coming up on March 8th, my point for having the Team Summit is to teach us about the power of knowledge, about training, about education, but to teach our young people that everybody doesn't reach their legitimate goal in life the same way. Somebody needs to dig ditches. Somebody needs to be a plumber. Somebody, we need to learn about everybody can do what is legitimately important to them instead of focusing everybody in the same direction that everybody's got to do the same thing in order to become successful. Education must enable a man to become more efficient, to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of his life. Another quote, at this point, I wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. I will make sure it does. But valid point there, Dr. King. And he says, the function of education is to teach one to think intently and to think critically. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. That is the goal. And I've said that to my daughter many times. I've told her, I'm not as concerned about the grade. I'm concerned about how you get the grade. There's this, this man, um, David Groggins, it, it's this black guy, he was a Navy SEAL and he's a motivational speaker now. And he talks about when he was in high school, how he got through high school was to cheat. And he couldn't even hardly read, but he got out of high school because he learned how to cheat. And nobody had told him that it was about character. That you don't have to worry about that, man. Let me, let me let you repeat so you can get it right. And I think that we need to make an emphasis on that with our young people that so that we don't have these highly educated, arrogant, empty, in a fog, sleeping through the revolution people in our community. A fifth point. Develop a community perspective. MLK said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. Quote, unquote, MLK everybody can be great. Another quote on community, those who are not looking for happiness are the most likely to find it because those who are searching forget that the surest way to be happy is to seek happiness for others. How beautiful, our community. And the point that I want us to, to think about on King Day is to live with urgency. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. In a speech called The Stride Towards Freedom in 1958, early, true peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. Because you can have absence of tension and you basically you could have beat the dream out of you. And, you're, and you get confused that you think that that's peace because your dreams have gone. And the, if you've read the, the book Black Boy by Richard Wright and he talks about his dreams have been beat out of him until he learns how to read and was exposed to different books. And that's how you'll find a lot of, of successful 
a successful black people in the 60s and 70s and before who left the country but to, in order to continue to pursue their dreams. Because, you know, because they could have stayed and looked like they were at peace, but they had no justice. And they said, no, I need to have true peace is justice. Let's seek that. So we have also another quote. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce age urgency. Now we're talking about living in urgency. His quote says to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. There, there, this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. How powerful. How powerful. You can't think that he's not talking about that political party and that political party and that block. He's talking about the entire democracy is saying, we'll gradually get to reparation. We'll get around to that. And it has never happened. Never happened. Because we have bought into gradual. Now it's so beautiful that they just have these great conversations and then and interview movie stars. And then your people that they feel that we respect that have nothing to do with our economy, our, our, our community, and what, how we deserve, what we deserve, but they're allowing this to be the part of the luxury of cooling off. Or it's a, the part of that tranquilizing drug of gradualism that Dr. King so eloquently put it. Mm. This is point number seven. Love every part of you and know that God loves us. Love every part of you. Your loving yourself individually creates our advancement as a family of black people in a world of relatives of another skin color. Through the world, though the world does not understand us in many ways, our unity and progress will serve as a reminder of all that we have done for this country and the world. That's my quote. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. That's Martin Luther King Jr. We're talking about loving every part of us. Mm, mm, mm. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. MLK. And MLK also quote in love talks about we must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. He who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. Amazing. And the eighth point, poverty, poverty. Now, I believe that poverty is strangling our community. And, and to make it out, it requires that you give more and that we invest more, uh, more of ourselves, more of our work into the less fortunate. You know, because the, there, there is this, well, like you, you, you know, think, and, and we've been taught that, you know, if you pull, if you try to help somebody else, you're going to be pulling down yourself and you're going to be pulling down yourself. No, no. It, one person not making it because I have the ability to, to teach them how to make it is one person that is too much. That's why I love our YouTube library. I, I, I saw a young lady, uh, 33 years old, um, first generation in America. She's from Senegal. Very inspired by her. Now, um, I'm not even sure. I don't even think she was born in this country. And she said, I listen to your stuff all the time. I was through. I was like, this is everything. 
This is everything. This is everything. We have a commitment to make information available that if you have something that can help someone else, make the information available. What if everything I did, I, you had to pay for? What if everything, I would never share any of this information. You know, that, that is ridiculous. You will be successful by your service. It will work out. You can help everybody. You will. Your value is determined by your commitment to providing value to someone else. And if you don't provide any value, your even possibility of making it as a person is cut short. Check this out. And this came from, where do we go from here in 1967? the um, chaos or community, uh, a writing by King. The temporary tendency in our society is to base our distribution, distribution on scarcity. Like, I better not do that, right? The, the contemporary tendency in our society is to base our distribution on scarcity, which has vanished, and to compress our abundance into the overfed mouths of the middle and upper classes until they gag with superfluity. If democracy is to have breadth of meaning, it is necessary to adjust this inequity. It is not only moral, but it is intelligent. We are wasting and degrading human life by clinging to archaic thinking. People hold on to information like there's some power there. No, if nobody knows about the information, it's not going to help anybody. And that has held our, our entire society back. But you have to not be that one. If you have information that can help someone, help someone. Be empowered. That doesn't mean that, you know, just you are strangling and creating poverty by holding back an opportunity to help someone else. That's why we have the free membership to Afroeconomics. There's no reason for no one not to take advantage of it. Though I see it all the time, that there will be people who will not take advantage of the free membership for some reason, but yet they don't, you know, that's always gonna be there. But you still have to make the opportunity available. You still have to make it. Have the strength to love. That's my ninth point. Know the power of the ability to love that way that I'm speaking of. Here's a quote from King. Without love, there is no reason to know anyone. For love will, in the end, connect us to our neighbors, our children, and our hearts. Another quote. We must learn to give together as brothers or perish together as fools. Mm, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. That's from 1964. A quote. Man must evolve for all human conflict, conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. Man must evolve for all human conflict, a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of which, of such a method is love. The foundation of that method is love. So we've got to rise above our human instinct to be afraid of each other to to feel like that's not my problem or even the need for if you have an enemy or a boss that is racist or uh, you know you know that they have you have done everything that you can do and you're not advancing in order to raise above that that's how i started my own firm it is because of discrimination that afroeconomics is able to exist because if I had gotten too comfortable in that negative situation or just put all my energy into aggressively attacking them and their practices, it would not have helped us at all. Instead, it, I have been able to move away from that and I have been able to develop relationships with many good white people to do, have partnerships with, build things with. To, to move forward that are about moving forward and about progression. 
because the foundation of such a method is love. I rejected revenge. I rejected aggression. I rejected retaliation. I did not put my energy in that. And you will not see it on any of the pages of our book. No, Afroeconomics, we're about moving forward and making the entire planet better. Nonviolence, a quote from King, nonviolence is absolute commitment to the way of love. Love is not emotional, is not emotional bash. It is not empty sentimentalism. It is the active outpouring of one's whole being into the being of another. That's love. And my 10th point is hold your position and apply more pressure. Don't settle. Getting in the store and our little sit-ins, big time now my dad participated in sit-ins in North Carolina. So dad, rest in peace. I'm, just, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying anything, but, but getting in the store now is just not enough. Allowing us to march is now not enough. Waiting on others to do the right thing for us now is not enough. Mm. Don't maintain hope in exchange for doing nothing. The urgency is now. Your individual decisions are vital to, to the success of this planet. I challenge you to accept that you are vital to your family's success, to your family's true peace, to your family's justice. You are vital to my success, my justice, and our community's success, and our community's justice, and to the world's peace. You individually are vital to that. And collectively, we can make a huge difference. Mm. Do it because conscience tells you it is right. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable work, inescapable work network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Mm. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. A letter from Birmingham jail, April 16th, 1963. It is not enough to say that we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and sacrifice for it. So in closing, I must add, as these Confederate, these Confederate monuments just start coming down and people are celebrating and the existence of slavery may be gradually faded away into what many might think is a disappearing history. It is up to us to remember that for generations, our ancestors were robbed of the opportunity to live. Our ancestors were used as machines and owned and traded like stocks. Our value was insured and the death benefit was paid to the owner of our ancestors. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Today, are you really free? Are you truly free? Let's make sure that the answer is yes. The mind is the standard of the man.